and I'm really sorry to everyone I've heard. It took authorities four decades to get to the man who terrorized Sacramento and Southern California in the 1970s. For over 40 years, countless victims have waited for justice, the FBI actually found the needle in the haystack. And it was right there in Sacramento, the answer was always going to be in the DNA. Former police officer. Joseph James D'Angelo is the notorious Golden State Killer. Who was behind serial rapes and murders across California, in the 1970s and 1980s. But decades passed before a suspect was identified. Thanks to the genealogy website. For lending a hand, to catch serial killer after 40 years. D'Angelo was born in Bath. New York. But graduated from Folsom High School in suburban Sacramento in June 1964. He was a sailor aboard the USS Canberra, returning home a decorated vet. To earn an associate's degree in police science, from Sierra College and a bachelor's degree in criminal justice at, Sacramento State. He got the honor TP served for two California police departments, as a police officer in Auburn until he was fired in 1979 for allegedly stealing a hammer and a can of dog repellent from a store. Also, while serving as a police officer, he shot and killed Professor Claude Snelling in front of his daughter at his Visalia, California, home. But he did not kill the little girl when he only kicked her three times in the face and then fled. Now, the picture got darker when he got fired, as in the summer of 1976, burglaries and rape cases terrorized people of Sacramento County. Back then, he would tie up couples, he surprised while they slept, then assault the woman. As the man lay helpless, he would place dishes on the man's back. Warning. That he would kill them both if the dishes rattled. He is actually blamed for 12 murders, 45 rapes, and the ransacking of more than 100 area homes. Despite his professional work, as he knew how they move and think as officers, he kept his ass away for about 40 years. But, there was another word to the DNA. Authorities actually began revisiting the case in 2016, around the time of the 40th anniversary of the first known attack. However, he was unknown to investigators. Until when DNA hit off some old evidence prompted put him directly in their sights. The new DNA techniques and more complete DNA databases recently allowed them to tie the various cases together. And D'Angelo was the bow. That new technique takes the DNA of an unknown suspect left behind at a crime scene. That identifies them by tracing a family tree through family members who voluntarily submit their DNA to public genealogy databases. And he became the first public arrest obtained through genetic genealogy. They narrowed the family tree search based on age, location, and other characteristics. Once authorities zeroed in on D'Angelo, they surveilled him and collected his DNA from a tissue left in trash. Here is how the pieces of the puzzle were put together. They already had obtained DNA from the unknown killer at one crime scene, the 1980 double murder of Lyman and Charlene Smith. Smith and his wife were bludgeoned to death in their home. They then started reviewing rape kits, which contained DNA samples from victims, in other jurisdictions. The alleged crimes spanned 10 counties. About six days before his arrest, investigators plugged his discarded DNA back into the genealogy database. And they found a match, linking D'Angelo's DNA to the DNA gathered at multiple crime scenes. He was then taken into custody at his home in Sacramento County, the same county where his alleged 10-year crime spree began. He was arrested without incident, outside his home. But, he was stunned to get caught. He only at the time was worried about his toast in the oven. But thank God. Detectives took care of it. After the arrest, survivor after survivor told stories of fear, grief, and resilience. I also put a victim impact statement at the end of the video. It is devastating. In his first interview itself, he admitted the counts against him in a weak, strained voice, saying each time, I anticipated that you will receive 11 consecutive life without the possibility of parole sentences, with 15 concurrent life sentences, additional time for weapon enhancements will be imposed as mandated by law. Do you understand that as well, sir? Yes. The aforementioned uncharged acts that you will be admitting to uh, having occurred in Sacramento County, Yolo County, 
San Joaquin County, Stanislaus County, Contra Costa County, Alameda County, and as well as Santa Clara County, as a result of these admissions to these uncharged acts, the, uh, the above listed counties have agreed to abstain from charging you with any offenses stemming from or related to those specific events for which you'll be admitting responsibility. All victims and victims' family members of the charged as well as the uncharged acts will be able to give a victim impact statement at judgment and sentencing without limitation as to time and without limitation as to content. At the time of judgment and sentence, you'll receive 11 consecutive life without the possibility of parole sentences with 15 concurrent life sentences. Additional time, as stated, for the weapon enhancements will be imposed as mandated by law. You will not be considered for any other sentence. Do you understand, sir? Yes. In addition, you agree to withdraw all pending motion as to today's date, June 29, 2020. As a condition of this plea, you will agree to waive any and all appellate rights. Uh, do you understand the terms of this plea, Mr. D'Angelo? Yes, you are. He admitted to shooting and killing Claude Snelling in front of Snelling's daughter when he broke into their home in September 1975. He also admitted to the attempted murder of a police officer, but was not charged with the crime. D'Angelo shot at the officer when the officer confronted him, trying to ransack a home in 1975. He also admitted that on October 5, 1976, just before 6.30 a.m. Jane Carson Sandler, mother, studying to get her nursing degree, was cuddling with her three-year son in her Citrus Heights, California, home, after her husband left for work. When a man broke in wearing a ski mask and holding a butcher knife, he shined a flashlight in her eyes. She wasn't actually paying attention to the rape, she was paying attention to what had he done with her son. He gagged and blindfolded them and tied them up with shoelaces. Then he came around and untied her ankles. At that time, she was only terrorized by her son as he raped her. After the rape was over, praise the Lord he moved her son back next to her and said, don't move or I'll come back and kill you. Then he goes into the kitchen and starts rattling pots and pans. She waited until stopped hearing him in the house. Then she was able to maneuver her blindfold and when she got her blindfold down, would you believe that her three-year-old was asleep? So, she woke him up, and they managed to escape to a neighbor's house, where she called the police. Meanwhile, her husband was still at work. She told the first respective detectives that she wanted to talk to a female one. Back then, they didn't talk about rape. It was a very shameful event. She was fortunate that she was number five, she was believed to be the fifth rapping victim at that time. He also said I admit to the February 1978 killing of Brian and Katie Majore. The couple was walking their dog. When Brian Majore was shot, Katie ran away and yelled for help, but D'Angelo caught up with her and shot her in the head. He also admitted to the killing of a couple in Goleta, California, in 1979 after which he rummaged through the fridge and ate leftovers. Also, in Goleta, friends Sherry Domingo and Gregory Sanchez were killed in July 1981. Sanchez was shot and then beaten to death, bludgeoned in the head two dozen times. D'Angelo then bound Domingo, raped her, and beat her in the head more than ten times. D'Angelo as well admitted to killing Lyman and Charlene Smith in their Ventura home in March 1980. Charlene Smith was also bound and raped. The couple was later found dead by Lyman Smith's 12-year-old son. He as well admitted to the killing of Keith Harrington and the rape and killing of his wife Patrice Harrington, who was bludgeoned to death at their home in Dana Point in August 1980. Keith Harrington, a medical school student, and Patrice Harrington, a pediatric trauma nurse, had been married for three months. D'Angelo admitted to the murder of Manuela Within, who was bound, raped, and bludgeoned to death while home alone on February 5, 1981. Her body was found by her mother. He admitted to the killing of 18-year-old Janelle Cruz, who was also bound, raped, three, and bludgeoned in the face and headed her home in May 1986. He attacked her. He beat her. And he raped her. Three of her teeth had been knocked out, and she had swallowed a significant amount of blood. And that was his last known crime. In a large enough room, filled with the survivors, family members, and media. The sentencing was held in a ballroom at Sacramento State University, a venue large enough for socially distanced seating for all the survivors, family members, attorneys, law enforcement, and media.
All right, Your Honor, on the 130 calendar, page 2, in custody, D'Angelo. Is uh, Joseph James D'Angelo your true and correct legal name? I'm sorry? Yeah. Yes. You're right. you before the uh, Sacramento Supreme Court for two reasons. One, to inform you there is a warrant, a hold for you, on the Denver County for two counts of murder, 187, Southern Virginia, the penal code. That case is 116. 1124. There is no bail The room was quiet save for the sound of camera shutters clicking, and tissues being pulled out of boxes, as D'Angelo was escorted in a wheelchair to the front. He sat flanked between his attorneys and two sheriff's deputies, wearing a face mask, staring down as the judge read the dozens of charges he had pleaded guilty to. It took the judge several minutes to read through the 13 murder charges, and 13 kidnapping-related charges. D'Angelo had spent most of the week's hearings staring straight ahead, not speaking. But there were gasps of surprise as he rose, and took off his mask, giving a short statement. I've listened to all your statements, each one of them. And I'm really sorry to everyone I've heard. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. He has transferred to a state prison facility. He is currently housed in the Protective Housing Unit, which is known for housing inmates whose safety would be endangered by general population housing.
Wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl. And to every single professional who had a part in solving this case, your crown awaits you in heaven. My deepest gratitude to each and every one of you. It seems like yesterday when Charlene and I met at Adolfo Camarillo High School, we had an instant lightning bolt connection like nothing I'd ever experienced before or since. In record time, we came to know about each other's interests and values and discovered we had a great deal in common. Charlene was born in Oxnard to a 17-year-old teen who was dating her father, Winslow Herzenberg. Winslow was an only child, as was Charlene. When Charlene was two, Winslow died in a car accident and Charlene was given up for adoption by her mother. Winslow's mother, Gladys Herzenberg, adopted Charlene and raised her alone until her passing in 1979 at the age of 86. Gladys was known affectionately by everyone as Grams. Foundationally, Grams was Charlene's everything and she quick, quickly became mine and my family's as well. Charlene, Grams, and my family, husband Don, and children Tiffany and Brett, spent as much time together as we possibly could. We had dinners, picnics, church, and especially playtime for Charlene and Grams with our children. From the moment Tiffany was born, Charlene just scooped her up as if she was her, were her own. <gasps> they even looked alike as Tiffany got older. They spent weekends together and the love they shared was m m remarkable to witness. When Brett arrived, both Grams and Charlene could just not get enough of him. Charlene endlessly tickled him and barely put him down. Brett had the luxury of Charlene carrying him around and cuddling him every time we were together. I wondered if Brett would ever learn to walk. Together, they were magical. Charlene worked while I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. When Grams was sick, I was able to care for her. When Grams had major surgery in our town of Thousand Oaks, she completed her six-week recovery at our house. Charlene would come and visit with Grams after work. We were a family of six. When Charlene married Lyman, we became a family of seven, just as smoothly as if, as if it had always been. Lyman was an incredible man in every way imaginable. He was warm, caring, thoughtful, fun, a wonderful father, kind, and whip smart. His boys, Jay and Gary, added two more and we became a family of nine from then on. Gary and Tiffany were just two years apart, so they hung out together at all our family gatherings. Jay enjoyed playing with Brett. He kept his eye on a busy Brett whenever our family gathered, making sure he was safe and having fun. Thanksgiving and Christmas were especially fun. As Charlene made any time together, 
special. Shortly after Lyman and Charlene married, and after seeing the abundant love they both had for our children, we asked them to become godparents. They were over the moon with joy at the thought of being permanently part of the children's lives. We planned a church service with our pastor and Lyman and Charlene planned an extravagant picnic at the park afterwards. Our children were, were the kids that Charlene had longed for and didn't have. It was a beautiful thing to see. Most of you have seen the photo I took of Lyman and Charlene with her right arm around Lyman's neck at the picnic we had after the church, church service the day they became godparents. If you look closely in that picture, you will see Charlene is wearing a gold band I had given her when we were young to match the one she had given me. We exchanged those gold bands to honor our sisterhood. Neither of us had ever removed those gold bands. Mine has not been off my finger almost 60 years now. Charlene's ring was cruelly stolen from her at the time of her death. One day, I pray I will get that ring back and it will join the one I continue to wear in Charlene's honor. Charlene was busy, always busy. She worked full time with weekends off. Together we decided to sell gold, which was a popular thing to do at that time. Each, is, each of us started our own gold business and both of us became ses, successful doing it. She would work all day and give showings at night. I would do showings in the evening after Don came home from work to watch the children. When we got home from a showing, no matter how, what time it was, we would call each other and share what we had sold and how much fun it was to meet terrific new people who then became our repeat customers. It was a wonderful time. Charlene always had a twinkle in her eye when she saw Tiffany and Brett. As a mother, nothing filled my heart more than to see her with our children. Lyman was the same ways from the moment he met them. But all you had to do was to see, to know what kind of a man Lyman was, was to spend time with his sons, Jay and Gary. They were wonderful in every way, fun, kind, loving, respectful, polite, and pure joy. I knew they would become responsible, successful men. They are all of that and so much more. When the Thousand Oaks Police Department came looking for me that very cold night in March of 1980. They told me I needed to speak to the de detectives at Lyman and Charlene's house. Leaving the children with neighbors, Don and I drove to their house in Ventura immediately. Upon arrival, We were told what had happened. We were in stunned shock. It was a hole in our lives that would never be filled. Not only did we lose Lyman and Charlene, 
we lost Jay and Gary as well. Don and I love those boys as if they were our own. Half our family had been wiped out. That is not something one recovers from. It's been a never ending ache and sadness that does not go away, away. For Lyman and Charlene's funeral, I made cards to pass out to all who attended. It was Psalm 139 verses 13 through 18. And I took it from the Bible Charlene had monogrammed and given me. It read, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them even came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts. God, how vast is the sum of them. They would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. We saw Gary after the funeral. He was 12 years old. He was the one that found his father and stepmother bludgeoned to death in their bed. He looked white as a sheet that day. I can't even imagine. We held each other tightly, not knowing what was ahead. It would be seven years later that we would get an unexpected knock at the door. It was sweet Gary. We were all at home that night and were beyond thrilled to see him. It was hard for all of us to find words. Gary was 19 years old then. So we were able to tell him how much we loved and missed him and he understood. <coughs> All of us love both Jay and Gary. We asked him to pass that same information along to, to Jay, and he said he would. The ensuing years have been hard for me. I am grateful for the daily reminder I have as I see the ring on my finger that Charlene gave me. When Tiffany was married, I felt Charlene's absence on a day that would have meant the world to her. When Brett joined the army to go on to serve in four combat zones and stay in uniform for over 20 years, both Lyman and Charlene would have bust, been busting their buttons with pride. Charlene was so much more than beautiful 
and Lyman so much more than handsome. When she and Lyman were taken, the world lost two amazing people full of life and both with bright futures. The gift of their presence in our family cannot be measured. The loss of their presence in our family has been gut-wrenching. I cannot allow myself to think of all of that they endured in death, but we know of the unspeakable horror they suffered. And for what? This is not, this day is not a man about the man who sits here awaiting sentencing. It is about every person whose life has been inexplicably changed and damaged in a way that has changed every one of them for life. Now they are left to make certain that their loved ones are represented for the remarkable people that they were. My heart goes out to each and every one of them. The only thing I'm grateful for is that Graham's passed away not even a year before Lyman and Charlene. I thank God every day that Graham's did not have to live through this nightmare. Now, they're all reunited in heaven. Winslow, Charlene's father, was buried in Los Angeles. When Graham's passed, Charlene and I took her ashes to his grave and spread them. When I picked up Charlene's ashes from the funeral home, I put them in our linen closet, which was utilized almost daily. Many years later, Brett said, Mom, it's time. I wasn't sure I could let her go. Brett assured me it was the right thing to do. He drove me to Winslow's grave where I spread Charlene's ashes that Winslow, Grams, and Charlene are all together. I will join them there when my time comes. They are only ashes, as we all have the gift of eternal life. People endlessly talk of closure. In my world, closure does not exist. This is a despicable event that never leaves you. I'm not able to extinguish someone as if they never existed and move on with my life. For me and my family, Charlene and Lyman have been joyfully a part of our everyday lives. We take them with us wherever we go. We take comfort knowing Lyman and Charlene are at peace. Knowing that brings us peace. And true peace will come when all of us join them and our whole family is reunited in the loving arms of our Lord. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Does anybody else wish to be heard? Uh, yes, Your Honor, thank you. 
at this time, uh, I would like to read a statement to the court on behalf of Carol Womack Billings. My name is Carol Womack Billings, and I am originally from Camarillo, California. Gladys Hertzenberg and Charlene Hertzenberg Smith were the only family that I had other than my adoptive mother. They were, and will always be, my grandma and my cousin, even though we were not blood related. As far back as I can remember, and further with the help of photographs, they have always been in my life. Charlene was eight years older than I was, but it never mattered to her. She took me everywhere with her. I cannot remember ever being without her by my side. When there were thunderstorms, I was there to protect her as she was afraid of thunder. When my adoptive mother was mean and abusive, Charlene was there for me. We were a team. I had a fantastic childhood because of these two women, Charlene and Gladys. When I had to move, it broke my heart, but we remained in each other's lives. The last time I was able to visit Charlene, she and Lyman had just purchased their home where they were eventually murdered. I was 22 at the time. I am 65 now, and my memory of the house is still so vivid. I am sure that is due to the horrific tragedy that occurred there. What I want the court to know is that I was 25 when Charlene was murdered. At that time, I had two young children. Because of Mr. D'Angelo's murderous actions, my family never got to know a fantastic human being. And I did not get to grow old with Charlene. She is in my thoughts almost every day and will be until the day I die. I miss her so much and society was deprived of an awesome person. I love you, Charlene. Thank you for your time, Your Honor. Carol Billings. Thank you, Counsel. Is there anybody I'm, else who wish to be heard? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. At, at this time, we invite <laughs> Jennifer Carol Smith to step to the podium. Thank you, Counsel. I think I've been called <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor, if you only knew how much time I spend with lawyers. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> I learned a good lesson from one of my guests here tonight is apparently you're not supposed to lawyer at home. You could have benefited from that in my house. I became a good speaker thanks to that lawyering at home from a very young age. Uh, last night was a rough night. Santa Cruz County is on fire. I'm worried about all my friends, worried even about my own home, which is in, in peril at this time, but it's, it's terrifying. Um, and I've watched this week everyone else speak, and I've, I was really sad yesterday, and then last night it hit me that, you know, I, I realized my perspective is limited to almost like six spots where I could just keep looking at the same six spots, which have been the screens on these streaming. And I've just been fixed by those six spots. And it must be terrible to have to have perspective limited like that. Cause in fact, I usually operate in the world with a very broad perspective. And that's what my speak, what I'll speak about today. So, um, and I think it's really important to pay attention to what's in your peripheral vision because it'll tell you what's coming. It'll tell you what's actually there, even if it's not right straight in front of yeah, you. Can I get you to do, do me a favor? 
Yes, sir. I want to hear every word you say. Speak. There we go. And I have my court reporters trying to keep up with you. So I'm sorry. And I usually am able to be heard, so I will do better. And you know it's okay. You just take as long as you want. We don't thank need you. to be in a hurry. Thank you. So I would like to thank you for this, for this opportunity this afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Jennifer Carroll. I grew up Jenny Smith. And I'm here on behalf of Lyman and Charlene Smith, my father and my stepmother. And I'm also here on behalf of the, the, the boys you just heard about, Jane Gary Smith. And thank you so much, Jill, for coming today. And I, I also want to thank Carol, who is somewhere out there in Etherland, for writing those statements because they both were adults and I wasn't. And they were able to know Charlene and my dad's life in a way I wasn't able to know. So it's so important to me that they were here to, today to speak on their behalf. I'm also here representing my father's brother, my Uncle Don, who I hope is watching right now, my mom, Marjorie Smith, to Margarita Marge, my grandparents, Lyman, Wilma, and Lila, my daughter, thank you for coming, and my nephews, who are too little to be part of this. They've trusted me with representing them throughout this process, and I've taken that responsibility incredibly seriously. It's, it's this is like kind of amazing because I see so many people that have supported me this whole time. Um, reporters, lawyers, everybody. So let's start at the beginning. And I, I, I really don't want Joe to experience this again vicariously, whatever. I know he's in his torpor somewhere trying not to listen, but um, hopefully a little of this will get through so he can remember. It was a gorgeous spring day in March of 1980 when my younger brother, Gary, arrived at my dad and Charlene's house to mow the lawn. At just 12 years old, he had already demonstrated tremendous self-discipline. I don't know about now, but he had it then. He took pride, he does have it now, he took pride in earning his own spending money. It was around noon when he entered the house, and I immediately knew something, he immediately knew something wasn't right. He was on his way to the back bedroom, my parents' room, and the digital alarm clock was going off. This had been going off for at least 72 hours, three days. The comforter pulled up over the two bodies that lay in the bed, hid most of the horror. I suppose I could thank you, Joe, for that courtesy, but then that would be perverse, wouldn't it? Because there was nothing courteous about what happened in their home that night. The walls were splattered with blood and gray matter. The bed was saturated with bodily fluids. Gary gently lifted the quarter of the comforter to find my dad's head face down in the pillow, cemented to the fabric by blood. His blood, an ungodly amount of blood. I would learn just a few weeks ago that it represented near the, all the blood in his body. That's exsanguination. Do you know how hard you have to work to get all the blood out of someone's body? Of course you do. Gary let the comforter drop, knowing he'd find the same on Charlene's side of the bed and just couldn't bear to look. He picked up the phone right there on the nightstand to call for help. And in that moment, my 12-year-old brother acted with incredible bravery and courage. Brave because he didn't know what would happen next. Courageous because it took the strength to stay focused and to do whatever he could for his dad and stepmom. It might interest Joe to know that a child finding his parents brutalized beyond imagination didn't grow up to be a bad person. It might interest Joe to know we are capable as humans of making good choices 
Despite seeing all that he saw Sunday afternoon, Gary did not become a perpetrator. As it happened that day, mom went to check on Gary, wondering if he'd made it up the hill to his bike on dad's house. Dad lived about a mile as the crow flied, but you had to ride up that damn hill on your bike. <clears throat> he, she rolled up on a scene that took her breath away. Police, yellow crime tape, and word that her son was with Judge Lewis and his wife, Claire. They had found Gary alone, sitting on the outside of the outside wall of my dad's house, patiently holding it together while the police swarmed around him. I will forever be grateful for Judge Lewis and Claire's kindness and quick response. Meanwhile, my other brother, Jay, the soft one, the sweet one, and I were at home waiting for my mom to come back. We assumed she was running errands. Jay was 15 and I had just turned 18. As soon as her car stopped in the driveway, Gary ran into the house and back to his room. He was crying. My mom was ashen. Jay and I turned our focus to her. Your dad and Charlene are dead, she said, and I didn't realize it then, but our lives would change forever. Sorry, we've all said that. It sounds like it's this throwaway statement, and, and the problem with changing forever is you don't really know what that change is going to mean. You don't know what you've lost. So I feel like that's a little bit of a throwaway sentence, but... I understand that you probably are all aware already of the impact you've had on so many. Joe might be surprised to learn that I was a suspect for two days. I still don't know how it was possible since Charlene had been raped. I don't know how it was possible because the force used to kill them exceeded my five foot two inch stature. I don't know how it was possible that anyone thought I could be in any way manifest that level of hate required to execute two people I loved. Apparently horrific, unimaginable crimes have a way of creating unintended consequences. I do know the police were likely desperate. They pursued every lead. I had to take a lie detector test. The irony is not lost on me, since I'm guessing Joe didn't have to take a lie detector test. The story was reported in the newspaper and the people in Ventura, my friends, my teachers, my family, my neighbors, knew I was a suspect. I was an 18 year old young woman barely an adult and a suspect in my own father's murder. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. That was awesome. <sighs> Your Honor, I ask you to imagine what that does to a young 18-year-old. I've lived with the shame for decades. <sighs> it's your shame, Joe. <sighs> Excuse me, just let me pull it together a little bit. Okay, here we go. It's a transition. <clears throat> Writing a victim impact statement after 40 years is not an easy task. Looking at the guidance provided, this statement has three objectives. To explain the physical, emotional, and financial effects of the crime. Let's discuss the physical impact. I suffered from migraines, depression, anxiety, but I was able to cope and move forward as everybody else who's been here has been able to do. My brothers were also physically resilient, so I can let this one slide. In fact, my family is remarkably healthy, thank God. Other than the true victims, my dad and Charlene, we have no physical scars. Financially, the situation is somewhat similar. 
in 1980, we had a lot of crime related expenses. I paid for almost out of those out of my, out of my share of my dad's life insurance. Alas, after 40 years, I don't have receipts. Uh, it's, I didn't expect a long game on this one. But Joe did. Joe had receipts. Joe and his wife Sharon worked hard to ensure that he'd be destitute at this point. Based on their efforts, he has no assets to attach. And just a fact check, it's unavailable to my family because these crimes happened in the years before victims were offered restitution. Yep, there are no financial damages I can claim. That means I'm only left with describing the emotional impact. Your Honor, I'm not sure I can do that, but I'm going to try. My mom always yells at me for sniffing. I can't be sniffing. <sighs> try it, Mom. I've struggled to write this statement because it's nearly impossible to know what would be if Joe didn't rape, torture, and beat my parents to death. How might they have changed the world? God love you. Who might I have become? How do I know what it might have been? Assessing the impact is challenging. Your Honor, my dad shares a resume that's extremely close to yours. You know I Googled you, right? Um, law school. <laughs> Also, I met one of your students. She's amazing, and she thinks you're amazing. Um, law school, some work in the DA's office, and then private practice handling litigation as a criminal defense attorney. He was hoping to be appointed by Jerry Brown to a seat on the Superior Court, exactly where you sit. Joe might find it interesting to know that my dad once sat where his attorney sit. Lyman defended a man facing the death penalty. He knew the man was guilty of rape and murder, yet he believed in the system that said his client was entitled to a defense. My dad faithfully championed our democracy and the rule of law. And thank you, all of you, for doing the same. Charlene was ready to have kids. Coincidentally, at 33 years old, she was the same age I was when I decided to have a family. I had known Charlene since I was five years old. As my dad's new secretary, she arrived with enthusiasm and style. I thought she was the hippest thing on earth. Short skirts, long hair, huge smile, and a decade younger than my parents. <laughs> that was for my mom. Um, she was the epitome. <laughs> my mom was not a 60s woman. She was the epitome of the mid-1960s in all the coolest ways. I wasn't thrilled a few years later.